You can turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We'll get there in just a second. Just uh, I have the opportunity to. I'll give uh, uh, parents some dates here just to uh, be reminded of once again. Uh, just coming up uh, tomorrow, we do have a work project here at the church. Uh, teens are going to camp. I uh, need extra money for that. Uh, that would be from 12 to 3. Once again, here at the church, they could eat at lunch before they come. Uh, that would be helpful. And then on Friday, uh, we have the A-Trip Missions meeting. Uh, that will be from 11.30 to 3.30, obviously for those teenagers only that are going on that missions trip. Uh, then uh, that would be for them, and lunch is provided for that. Um, then Sunday night, we have another sports prep as well after the evening service up to 9 o'clock. And so fitting in three of those this summer. And so um, that'll be an opportunity there, obviously, to get some uh, work in as far as the sports that are played a lot at the ranch. And uh, also just to, I don't know, have fun as well, hopefully. Uh, I think it's somewhat fun until people start uh, punching each other in the face, and then it's not so much fun after that, but whatever. Uh, Hard to believe, but one week uh, we'll be uh, leaving uh, for the A-trip down to El Paso. I know Brother Dave mentioned that already. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that trip. And uh, so if you'd be much in prayer uh, for that, that would be great. A busy summer, right? And uh, it just seems like it never ends. It's like uh, somebody asks, how's your summer going? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know if this thing's being a nuisance or not. But uh, anyways, it just seems like it's just, you know, I traded one thing for another. That's how it is. And uh, so uh, anyways, it's always, uh, always busy here. And that's, that's good. It's good to be busy for the Lord. So uh, anyways, I uh, uh, be much in prayer for the activities this summer and uh, be much in prayer for the teenagers. They go on these missions trips and then camp in uh, July, which is just right around the corner as well. All right, uh, Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, and I have a little Bible study here uh, tonight. And um, so we'll, we'll go through... Uh, uh, quite a few passages. I may have you turn a little bit here, um, but uh, this is where we'll kind of start off. No specific uh, text or anything, uh, but a title would be, uh, we're looking at principles that, that we can follow that would help us to have an effective Christian life. And I believe that, uh, although we never know, but uh, in a Wednesday night here, I believe that we're Christians here. This is the cream of the crop of our church here for a Bible study, and uh, uh, we, we should have that desire to want to live that Christian life in an effective way. I don't think anybody woke up this morning and said, boy, I, I want to fail in life today. I mean, if that was you, the door is right back there, okay? We don't want any negative people here. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's not our dream, whether it be in the spiritual life, whether it just be life in general, uh, we want to succeed, right? Uh, we, want, uh, we want there to be uh, uh, some, some effectiveness in our life. We want, it, we want our life to be helpful uh, and needed. We want to feel needed, right? That's just, uh, that's just who we are. That's, that's human nature. That's a natural way of thinking. And, uh, and so, and that should boil on over, obviously, into our spiritual life. As we live our Christian life, we want to be effective, uh, we, we want to uh, be helpful. We want to be uh, needed. By the way, the Lord needs us. God needs us here today to be Christians that are going to live um, for him. And so, uh, obviously, we're thinking about the Christian life, and uh, the thought is this. Why, why would you waste your time doing something if you knew that that something had no worth in the end. Why, why would you waste your time doing something if you knew that in the end that it's just going to be worthless? We wouldn't sign up for that, right? But the Bible does tell us that it's worth it to live the Christian life, and it's worth it to live it His way. And uh, so uh, when you think about that thought here, when you became a Christian, okay, uh, you were called, uh, obviously we know the process of becoming a Christian, we know that you called upon Jesus Christ to save your soul, right? You're a child of God, a part of the family, 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, but a Christian, as I know pastors mentioned too, it's, it's a little Christ. And uh, we're an example of the Lord. That's your new identity now. And with that new identity comes a new way of life, a new mission that we have to live out. The Bible says that old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And some may say, you know, unfortunately, some may say, oh, I didn't sign up for that. It's like, oh, I want salvation, but I don't want to live the Christian life. It doesn't make sense. When you become a Christian, you have to live the Christian life. That's what's expected of you. And so it's, it's not like, I mean, people treat it like that. It's just, I just want the salvation, but I want to live my own way. No, that's not what God intended. God intended for us to live a life that is effective, okay? Uh, the, the Christian life that is effective. And, and how are we to live that? Titus chapter 2, uh, we, we kind of get a, a little idea here and what uh, the Lord expects from us. We're actually going to dig a little bit deeper in some principles found in God's Word. But Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, and it talks about the whole gamut here. It talks about salvation right off the beginning. In verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that, here we go, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Okay, so here's a piece of the puzzle here to the Christian life. We're going to deny ungodliness, and we're going to deny worldly lusts. And then it says that we should add these things. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's just one example there of a passage that shows us, okay, as a believer, we have a new identity, a new life. And if we want to be effective, we're going to follow what God's Word says. I love the verse, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Another verse that's written to the saints there in the church. And uh, we as believers now, no matter what we do in our life, we're living it for the glory of the Lord. So there's no questions asked. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, we are to live for the Lord, period. And we know that we will fail, right? Uh, that's a part of the real Christian life. Uh, I think you guys may be wrapping it up like we are, but we've been going through the, the real Christian life curriculum in Sunday school class with the teens, and I've been in it for over a year. Can you believe that? That's just how long it takes me to get through that. I'm about ready to wrap it up. But it does say in one of the lessons that failure is a part of the real Christian life, okay? You will fail. It's, it's normal. It's a part of the Christian life, but we're going to get back up. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep pressing on. Why? Because Christ did that for us. We remember Christ. In those moments when you feel like you're a failure, in those moments when you feel like you're so far gone, remember Christ. Remember what he did for you. And that'll motivate you to keep pressing on for him. Paul had that same experience, right? Paul had this, uh, he definitely had a, a lot of instances where he wanted to throw in the towel. Uh, but he remembered what Christ did for him. It says, the love of Christ constraineth me. In other words, it motivates him to keep pressing on. So keep pressing on. Remember Christ. Be encouraged. Uh, by what he's done for you. And that'll encourage you to love him more. It'll encourage you to live your life of service to him, yielding to him. And then in return, you're going to grow in the Lord as well. And, uh, and, and when you grow in the Lord, when you, when you love him because of what he's done for you, uh, when you yield to him, you're surrendered to what he, uh, whatever he has for you to do, when you do those things, and then when you, uh, that you're going to grow in the Lord naturally, that's going to result in that. And as you grow in the Lord, those actions, the, the things that you do in your life, your Christian life, are going to be honoring and pleasing to the Lord. But it all starts with just remembering what God did for you, having a greater appreciation and a love for what he's done for you. Failures will come, but we can continue on because he has done so much for us. 
One other promise that will help us to be effective, too, in the Christian life is not to forget that God is with us as well. He gives us the encouragement, the strength to continue on. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth, the promise that he gave uh, to his disciples. He tells us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, He says that he is a very present help in trouble. And uh, we can probably, verses maybe are popping into your mind as well, but we know that God is here for us. It's a promise. He's there when we need him the most. How is he there for us? Well, we know when we become saved, a Christian, a believer, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life. He is the comforter. He guides us, convicts us, does many other things for us, helps us out. We also have one other thing, too, that we know that God is with us. And what a privilege that we have uh, that we have here today to have God's word with us. And uh, no, don't ever take that for granted. God is with us, and we know that he's everywhere. He's also with us in this word, too. And uh, what an amazing thing that sometimes we overlook sometimes. God's word is, is filled with who he is, and he has specific things for us to do. God reveals himself to us through his word. And uh, this book is truly an amazing book. It should be our only rule of faith and practice. Uh, God reveals himself through that. This book is to be studied uh, by the believer continually, as we looked at, I believe it was Sunday, a pastor preached on that as well, and how we should be students of God's word. Uh, and uh, this book is to be protected by us. It, it should be protected by us. We should do our part uh, in protecting God's word. Uh, we should be cherished by us, and we should think about it often. That's the type of book that this is. And if we choose to let the, God's word collect dust on the shelf, you can be sure that your Christian life will most likely be collecting dust as well and will be kind of pointless, useless for the Lord. And so this is a crucial part of you, us as believers, sorry, uh, making sure that we're living the Christian life correctly and uh, being in his word. It's the holy word of God. It instructs us, guides us on how to live the Christian life the effective way. Well, ever since the new year in youth group, uh, I have been, uh, I just I thought it was a, a good opportunity to, uh, and I think it's a great series, but we've been talking through biblical principles in, in youth group, and just picking something new every, every night, and uh, um, something from God's Word, obviously. Uh, obviously, there are other principles, what we're focusing in on, the principles that are found in God's Word. And uh, so I've been enjoying that personally myself. I, I've seen and learned a lot of things, a lot of great truths, and sometimes I've had my toes stepped on uh, because I, I've seen something that maybe that's not the way that I'm living. But God's Word said it, so I need to obey it. And that's the idea there of a principle, uh, especially when it comes to the principles that are found in the Bible. It's an unnegotiable type of thing. In other words, what does that mean? It basically means that as a believer, I must obey it, okay? There's no questions asked. If it's in God's word, I must obey it. I can't, I can't give in, there's no wiggle room, right? Uh, I have to take it for what it says, what God's telling me through that, and I need to do it, okay? And so that's what a principle is in God's word. Just like our earthly life, is guided by different principles, so our Christian life as well is guided by the principles that are found in God's Word. I'd like to point out a few of those here tonight, and uh, uh, these specific principles are um, ones that will help us to just effectively live the Christian life like the title says. The number one here, if you're taking notes, uh, sorry, I don't have the slide or anything up in the back, but number one there is the principle of vision. The principle of vision. And we'll be over in Luke chapter 11, if you turn there. Luke chapter 11, principle of vision. It's an important uh, principle here. 
Uh, obviously, it's uh, you probably already got the idea of talking about our sight, what we see. And uh, very important that we uh, make sure that, that we're careful about what we allow our eyes to see and so on. Uh, you know, it may come as a shock to you, but seeing is an important part in knowing of what direction you're heading. Uh, if you've ever seen somebody that's blind, you know, they, they amaze me, right? They're able to get around with uh, whether it's that stick that they have or whatever. They're able to go and do some things. Uh, that's quite amazing. But for me, it's just like I think if I were to lose my vision, I'd be tripping over everything. It's like I can barely keep, walk straight anyway. So it's like that would, that would just be me. So when you think of vision, okay, you think of, all right, that, that's very important to knowing what direction that you're heading in. And we're talking about uh, having an effective Christian life that has everything to do with the direction that you're heading in. Uh, and so obvious there, right? Luke chapter 11 and look at verse 34. Luke chapter 11 and verse 34. It says this, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. So here we have a contrast here. We have light and then we have darkness. The, the, the verse explains this. If what we allow our eyes to see be wicked then that's what's getting into our body is wickedness. If what we allow it to us, ourselves to see is, is good and edifying and light, obviously the light is coming in there. And the thought is this, ultimately what you focus on, whether that be the Lord or whether that be the darkness of this world, that's ultimately going to determine your destination whether spiritual or whether worldly. So what we focus on is our responsibility, okay? And what we focus on determines our effectiveness in this Christian life. A couple things about this thought here, uh, just to kind of add more to this, but uh, uh, number one here, your eyes will affect your mind, and then your mind, or what you think, will affect your actions, correct? And so that's very crucial, right? Making sure that we're living the Christian life like we ought to. Therefore, we need to make sure that we're guarding what we see. Uh, and because that will affect our mind, and then our mind will affect our actions. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. Um, I won't have you turn there, but we know the story well. Eve, okay? The verse says there that Eve saw. You saw that the tree was good for food. So there's that first step there. It's a visual thing. She saw that the tree was good for food. And then she had the thought that it was pleasant to the eyes. It says that. And then we know the rest of the story, right? Then she ended up action, right? She ended up eating of the fruit, the, the forbidden fruit that the Lord said not to eat. So that's a classic example there. Unfortunately, in this world we live in today, uh, we know all too well that there is, uh, we are bombarded with uh, visual traps, correct? And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take, it's, you go into any store these days, they're there, right? The billboards and so on. Unfortunately, with the use of technology, it's very easy to, uh, to see things that, that the Christian should not see. And so these things may be accidental, and accidental. And in those instances, what should we do? We should draw our attention back to the Lord, okay? Things that happen by accident, we could go through the whole thing, right? You, you see something, it's like, okay, there's the temptation. Are you going to dwell on it? Or are you going to think of something else and move away from that temptation? We know that, Right? But in those instances where we unfortunately see something we're not supposed to, we know the danger of what we see, and it can lead us down the wrong path. We want to make sure that we automatically, in those instances, let's draw my focus back to the Lord. 
draw my focus back to the Lord. That's got to be a habit. We got to do that. We got to work at that. We got to trust in the Lord, those things. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about that too. We, we know that it says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Lamentations chapter 3 says that mine eye affecteth my heart. And some of us here today, if we, if we want to live an effective Christian life, we want to be used by the Lord in a great way, we just need to dedicate ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to protect my heart. As this world comes in, becomes increasingly more wicked, uh, and, and especially through that, the lust of the eyes, right? Uh, we need to make sure that we guard our heart, that we guard what we allow into our eyes, and that it'll affect our heart and mind, and ultimately it'll affect our actions. We'll be off the path that the Lord would have for us. Keep your focus on the Lord. Keep your focus on others as well and the needs of other people. That's so crucial too, right? Uh, sometimes we, we're just all about ourselves, the focus there. But can I encourage you to focus on God, focus on others, be, be, uh, be uh, 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 the individual that sees the needs of others and has a desire to help them out. So that would be the first uh, principle there, found in God's Word. The second principle here that I'd like to mention is the principle of, of being a representative. The principle of being a representative. And uh, this is a crucial one as well. And uh, for this, uh, we can look at uh, Acts chapter 11, if you turn there. And a couple verses I want us to see there in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11. Being a representative, the principle of, of, uh, that the God gives us here is being a representative of him. Again, we're, we're Christians, we're believers here. And so we are called, God tells us in his word, that we're supposed to represent him. We all have a name, right? Uh, we can go through and you could shout out your name. Don't do that, but uh, we all have a name. And uh, that name represents you. You know, you ever had somebody tell you, yeah, you look like a Tony, or you, you, you look like so-and-so. Like, uh, I don't know how that's the case, but anyways, uh, you, your name says a lot about you, especially here in a church setting close uh, with people. You know, if you hear, hear a name, you're like, okay, I know who that is, and I know a little bit about them. And so the name, uh, your name represents you, it identifies you. Uh, that's what a name does when your parents gave you that name. Uh, that was an identification label for you. That's you, who you are. And another name that you have, though, here tonight is the name Christian. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus to save you, you were given a new name. That name is Christian. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the first mention here, Acts chapter 11, I'm like looking at verse 26, and I'm in Luke. My bad. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, actually, the name Christian back in Bible days was an insult. If somebody were to call you a Christian, they'd be making fun of you. They'd be, uh, uh, you know, laughing at you because that guy's a Christian. What a dork, you know, so on. And they would just, it wouldn't be anything good to say. If you had that name title Christian, you were an outcast. That's who you were. But the disciples, they took that name Christian and they wore it as a badge of honor, Right? And they were proud to be called a Christian. Why were they proud to be called a Christian? As I mentioned before, that word Christian means little Christ. They were representatives of, a, of the Lord. And no greater privilege than to represent Jesus Christ and be able to be called a Christian. And so today, we are called Christians as well. And don't be ashamed of that. Be proud of that. You carry the name of Jesus Christ with you. You represent him. What a great privilege that you have today. But also with that privilege, we know, comes what? Responsibility. 
Okay, we, uh, there's responsibility. We, we have to carry that name very well. I'm sure maybe your parents or your dad or whatever said, you know, you better carry that name well, son. And uh, like I've been told countless of times, and still I wonder, did I carry that name well? I have no idea. But, uh, you know, that right there is the same idea here. We want to carry that name Christian well. Throughout the book of Acts, we see also that the Christians were followers of the way, okay? Here we're talking about our direction, the path that we're traveling here as believers. Uh, we, are, we are on this Christian life, this journey that we have, and we are going to do it right, what the Lord wants. We're going to be effective in those ways. If you look at Acts chapter 9, and we're just a, probably a page back for you there, Acts chapter 9 says this, And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Again, we see here a picture of the Christians. Any of them that were going this way, this specific direction, we see that the Christians went a specific way. Uh, look at chapter 19. And there's quite a few of these in the book of Acts, chapter 19 and in verse 9. Chapter 19 and verse 9 says, But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way, talking evil of Christians, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And then uh, look at verse 23 there in the same chapter. In the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. And again, we're talking about believers here. There's, these, are, uh, these are what uh, demonstrated them. They were representatives and they were individuals that went in a certain direction, a certain way. We don't need any more Christians that say, oh, I'm a Christian Okay, but I'm going to go this direction. I'm not going to go the way. We don't need anybody. We need, we need Christians that stay on the path, that are effective for the Lord. It's the way of life for us. And it was a privilege to those Christians to live a life of representation for the Lord. Uh, it is a principle that's found in God's word, and I, I represent Christ in everything that I say and do. That's the idea behind that. And uh, so crucial that whatever we do in this life, we keep in mind that I'm a representative for the Lord. If we as Christians are to take these principles properly, we must understand a few things here. Number one, my behavior will ultimately affect Christ's representation or reputation. My behavior will affect Christ's reputation. As a Christian, the Bible says that we are also ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us that. What does an ambassador do? Well, an ambassador speaks for and acts on the interests of the country that that person is representing to that other country. So you, you wouldn't expect an ambassador to talk trash about America in a foreign country. My guess is that he would lose his job if that was, if that was the case. You know, these are things that are uh, where he's supposed to be supporting the interests of the, of the country, being a good representative of the country. So if there is no support for that country, then that person's not carrying his job title correctly. Same is true for the Christian. Everywhere you go, everything that you do, you are a representative for the Lord. You are representing, representing the Lord to a lost and dying world. How are you doing? How are you doing a good job? Are you, when somebody would look at you and say, all right, uh, I don't really get in a good picture of church. I'm not getting a good picture of Jesus Christ based upon the way that you're living your life. That's on us. Because we're not doing what we ought to be doing and being a good representative for the Lord. In your conduct, in your speech, in your actions, we need to be promoting Christ to the people that are around us. Number two, people will think of Jesus whatever that they think of you. People will think of Jesus whatever that they think of you. 
You know, some people will never come to church. Some people will never open up a Bible. Uh, and we brush shoulders with these people each and every day, right? So we, in a sense, are, uh, it's not technically correct, but we're, we're almost like the Bible to these people. We, well, we are. We're representatives of Christ. We're little Christ. We're examples to these people that would never come to church, that would never open up a Bible. And uh, so what people see in you is ultimately what they think of church, what they think of God's word, what they think of the Lord. It's a lot of pressure, right? Boy, that's our duty. That's what we're called to do, be representatives. Do others see Jesus in you? Number three, and this is, uh, boy, this is hard to take, but there's no off duty. There's no off duty when it comes to this. Just like a police officer, you know, they would have a time where they're technically off duty, but they're still expected to uphold the law, right? Uh, they, they can't go and do their own thing. Unfortunately, some do. But, uh, you know, that's we're humans, right? Uh, but uh, when it comes to being a representative for the Lord, there's no off duty. And we need to be always on the clock. Or we're always going to live for Christ. You know, we're not just representing him on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or maybe in certain times in, in your family when you're in front of the kids or whatever. Uh, no, that's not what we're going to represent. We're going to continually represent him and continue to do so. The final principle here for tonight is the principle of being ready. The principle of being ready. Uh, the principle is this, I must always be ready to explain my faith and explain that to other people. I, may, I must always be ready to do so, right? It's so crucial when we're, when we're thinking about living our Christian life to the best of our ability, being effective and what we do, we should have that desire. We're thinking of our vision, right? Because we don't want it to get off track. We want to continue on the path that God has for us. We're understanding that we're a representative of him. That ought to kind of motivate us to, I want to do what's right. I want to make sure that my life is pleasing to him. And then also, well, we got some work to do. Maybe we're not quite uh, to the place where we feel comfortable sharing God's uh, good news. Uh, but this encourages us to. God's word as a principle found in it encourages us as believers to be ready always to give an answer of the hope that is within us, correct? And uh, so if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, and I think this will be the last passage I'll have you turn to here tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3. By the way, this is God's plan for us. This is God's plan to reach the world. Isn't it amazing that God chooses to use us to reach the world? What a, what a responsibility that we have uh, before us. We don't want to fail him. We want to do our best in what we can do. And There's so many avenues that, that God gives us to reach this world, and our church is a part of it uh, a, a ton of different ways. And I won't name them, but you can probably think of some right now. And what an awesome privilege that is. And we need to be sensitive and obedient to that calling that he gives us. Uh, in First Peter chapter 3, and starting in verse 14, it says, But in if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is, within, that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And through this, we see that we need to be ready to give the answer. I want, to, I want to show you one more thing here about why God's Word is so important. Because I believe that this book right here is powerful. I believe that this book right here can transform people's lives, but it also teaches us very valuable things. It is the foundation for everything that we believe, right? In Romans chapter 10, and verse 17, it says this, So then faith cometh by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. So with that, I go back to my instructions, okay? We cannot be effective Christians and an effective witness unless we are students of God's word. Unless if we are understanding what it is that we are preaching, what it is that we're handing out to individuals. Okay? If we are going to be Christians that are going to be ready always to give an answer, whether that be of, of the hope that's within us, salvation, or whether that be one of those why questions. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? You know, uh, if you haven't got them, I'm sure you will, and it catches you off guard sometimes. But if we're studied up on God's word, we will know how to give an answer to those that ask. We know that the opinions of men sometimes fail. Even good people, good men, uh, can even unfortunately teach wrong things, okay? It's encouraged. I encourage my teens to say, hey, don't, don't, uh, don't take it from my mouth, okay? But I would encourage you to do the work yourself, to study, study God's word, dig in a little deeper, okay? God's word is unchangeable. God's word is eternal. And the more that we know the truth, the stronger the foundation of our belief will be. But that's not the only thing. We must not just have the knowledge of, of what God's word says. Well, uh, by the way, I want to throw this in. We, we ought to allow that knowledge to affect our lives as well. Uh, what's, what is knowledge if it doesn't affect your life, right, when it comes to God's word? But also, I'm just talking about when we're giving it to other people, it's good to know the truth, know to, the information to give out. But also, the verse continues on there in uh, verse 15, uh, towards the end, it says to do it with meekness, meekness and in fear. And uh, I think it's great to be able to give things in a loving way. Give things in a loving way. Uh, you know, just as much as I know, that seems like a lot of people seem to get offended very easily these days, right? Uh, just over some of, the, some of the silliest things we would think, right? But we don't know that person's life. We don't know what they're going through. Uh, God does, okay? Uh, but uh, it does seem like that's, that's a thing, right? But we, we never want to say something, give truth to somebody. Sometimes the truth is a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? A boy God could use us if we are looking to him and, and we're allowing him to work through us. Because when you, when you look at the life of Christ, uh, you always see compassion. You always see love. And that's what we want to do as well. We want to be compassionate. We want to be loving in this uh, world that we live in when we are giving out the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, so much more I could say about uh, these things, but uh, I think for sake of time, I'll stop there. And uh, I hope uh, you have a desire as a believer to make sure that your Christian life is effective. Who, who doesn't want to be effective, right? Who doesn't want to just... I, mean, I don't know, maybe there are some people that's like, I don't want to do anything. I want to be a bump on the log. Maybe you deserve that because you worked most of your life. I have no idea. But when it comes to the Christian life, we're always on duty. We want to be effective in that area of our life. And uh, how can we do so? I just encourage you to get into his word. Find out, dig into those promises, the principles that he gives us, and uh, soak that in, allow it to impact your heart and your life. Follow them, obey them, and God will help you to stay on the right path. Okay? Keep your eyes focused on him. Don't, don't focus on the world. Understand your position as a believer, as a representative, Jesus Christ. And then uh, the third thing there is we want to be ready always to give an answer of the hope that is within us. Hope that